In this video, we're going to talk about Justice's Rationality in the Evaluation of Men from Chapter 8 of Leonard Peikoff's book, Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand. Stay tuned. So let's dive in with a summary. So we get that justice is the virtue of judging men's character and conduct objectively and then giving to each person that which he or she deserves. And the basic issue is that all of life requires knowledge and judgment. It requires saying true or false, right or wrong. But we need to give special attention to human beings because uniquely they, like us, have free will. And part of what that free will means is that you ha that they can have a major impact on your life and a major impact that can be hard to assess so you can basically know more or less what to expect from a lion or a dog you can't know what to expect from a human being and it can be the difference between life or death and everything in between and so the goal is to spot and encourage the good and spot and discourage the bad intellectually then it's justice is using reason to reach moral estimates you have to gather fact and gather facts and evaluate according to rational moral principles and as part of that there's no universal estimates there's no shortcut there's no all men are good all men are evil all men are gray it's that you actually have to look at the individual and make the hard assessment gather the facts to say is this individual good? Is this individual bad? Is this individual mixed? And if they're mixed, you need to be able to specify and separate out what are the good elements, what are the bad elements. Existentially, then, justice is granting to the individual that which he deserves. And the basic idea is that you encourage values with values, you, you discourage disvalues with disvalues. And this is... A real requirement because there's no escaping justice it's if the bad don't suffer the consequences of their vices good people will if good aren't rewarded bad people will benefit and so if you want to encourage the good and you want to discourage the bad you have to grant to individuals that which they deserve one of the most important rewards you, that you have the power to give and to withhold is your moral sanction, which you can think of as your moral approval, your, your moral encouragement. And your primary obligation is to identify and encourage the good. And as <clears throat> and it's only from that perspective then you can say, well, it's also important to withhold your moral sanction from the evil, to engage in the pretense and to help the evil engage in a pretense that it's not evil. And the result of giving your moral sanction to the good and withholding it from the bad is that you're helping to create a human society where good people have the sense that, yes, participating in this society, creating values and bringing them to this society, that's worth the struggle, that's worth the setbacks, because this is a human society that values effort, achievement, the good. In terms of gaining values from others, the, the perspective is, the trader principle that is you don't seek or accept the unearned you trade value for value materially and spiritually so it's not just about like you trade a dollar to the grocer to get a pack of gum but it's that you trade you know admiration love and respect for your friends in exchange for that same kind of spiritual reward for yourself we get that this flies in the face of christianity that though uh, justice demands earned forgiveness what christianity preaches is unearned forgiveness i.e mercy which requires a complete evasion of a person's evil and therefore constitutes treason to their victims the greatest perversion of justice though leonard talks about is egalitarian social justice which means equality supersedes justice to achieve equality means, well, we penalize the able because they're the able, the successful because the successful, the good because they're good, in order to bring everybody down to the lowest common denominator. And that this is 
the worst perversion of justice. It's really anti-justice and therefore is going to create a world inhospitable to human values. So let's go through our MPI analysis. We have the principle is justice as rationality in the evaluation of men. The intellectual side, as we've said, is judging men objectively, gathering the facts and evaluating them by um, rational moral principles. And then existentially, it's granting to each man that which he deserves. The metaphysically given fact that's being recognized is that human beings are volitional, or if you want to put it differently the way Ayn Rand often would, human beings are individuals. We are men of self-made soul. The first thing I want to stress that Leonard makes and I think really needs to be taken seriously is that justice is primarily a positive. It's primarily about the positive. And yet, if you think about how people typically use it, it often evokes a negative. It's denouncing, punishing the bad. And I think partly that's because we're used to thinking about justice in a courtroom context where like you're not getting hauled before a judge to like congratulate you and say you're amazing. It's you're getting hauled in there like, are you going to be thrown in jail? Are you going to face some sort of punishment? But I think an even more fundamental reason that we view it negatively is because of conventional sacrificial morality. So if you think about altruism, as we've talked a lot about in these videos, it's mainly about denouncing don't do that. That's selfish. Give it up. And so insofar as justice is regarded as virtuous at all, it's mainly about imposing penalties on the selfish. It's mainly about saying, no, you didn't sacrifice for others and therefore you're going to pay. Or if you want to put it in a religious context, right? It's, all right, you obey God's commandments and if not, to hell with you, right? But for objectivism justice should evoke a real positive it's that i'm on a quest for values and i'm on a quest for those who are on a quest for values most acts of justice are not and should not be public denunciations or even in many cases public praise um, most acts of justice are you're identifying values and finding good people to deal with treating them well and developing mutually beneficial relationships with them so that both of you can prosper. And so like when you think of justice in your life, a lot of what should be flooded is like, how do I show gratitude towards my mentors? How can I build a better team at work? How can I make my marriage stronger? It should be real focused on identifying the positive, encouraging the positive and this doesn't mean that the negative is unimportant. It's that you want to spot bad people and you want to spot the bad and good people and you need to take that seriously. But it's not denunciation as an end in itself and it's not like, it's not a healthy attitude if you're getting out of bed any morning, every morning thinking about how can I spot those bastards and take them down. It should be seen as, okay, you've interrupted the flow of my day in effect you're a threat to me and the people that i care about and therefore i'm going to act accordingly but it's it's not ruminating on kant and james taggart and al capone and what bastards they are it's you identify them so that you can continue focusing on your trajectory of pursuing and achieving values and doing that in concert or in um in ways that help and encourage others around you whether in your life directly or in your society to create values and it's a similar issue with moral sanction moral sanction is primarily a positive focus on endorsing the true and the good because it is the true and the good it's primarily about encouraging the values that you that other people are creating that you want to see more of in your world and refusing to sanction the evil it's a secondary issue it's not allowing the evil to engage in the pretense that it's good or that it's true and i mean the way i think about it is i don't want evil to ride on my coattails to the extent that i'm doing anything good that i'm creating values i don't want those to be used in the service of things that are destroying it but i mean 
you could put it this way, this might be a little too strong, but I'm way more terrified of not sanctioning the good than I am of, oh man, I accidentally sanctioned the evil. And there's a lot of debates that objectivists will get into. And, and I think important debates and real hard questions about when you should collaborate with people, on what terms should you deal with them, when should you not. And all of that's fine. I think all of that's important. But I think your orientation should be primarily what relationships can I cultivate? What ways can I collaborate? And then if you find, you, you might find, like looking back, yeah, I shouldn't have gone in that, you know, radio show. Um, that host is actually at, like pretty garbage. And I, I think I was, uh, you know, bringing him an audience that he couldn't have otherwise gotten. There may be cases like that. Um, but that is, I think, the the you know the worry the thing that is so lacking in the world is not i don't want to put it that way but the main thing you should be thinking about is spotting the good and doing what you can to encourage it again i'm not demoting the importance of not sanctioning evil i'm trying to elevate the importance of sanctioning the good and that leads to a topic that i want to go into which is the issue of non-judgmentalism, and in particularly non-judgmentalism in the objectivist world. So in 1983, Leonard Peikoff gave an amazing course that I'm sure I've referenced time and again in these videos, Understanding Objectivism. And it touched on, I mean, it covered a lot about moral judgment and in particular judging intellectual honesty. And Leonard's main goal in that course was really to beat rationalism out of the objectivist movement. Rationalism, as we've talked about, is a way of mental functioning where it's abstractions above reality. It's ideas cut off from concrete. And basically, you just start with some abstractions that come out of thin air, i.e. stuff you got from Ayn Rand, usually. And then you just try to deduce everything from there without reference to reality. And... Um, in his efforts to beat rationalism out of the objectivist movement, one of the things he talked about is that there's this false alternative that's offered between moralizing condemnation and, uh, how did he put it? Well, and this is what rationalists will often engage in, is just like a kind of um, obsessive focus on that's evil, that's evil, that's evil, and amoralism which Leonard puts it as, he says, is not worth discussing because the attitude of, uh, the attitude that, well, everybody is really wonderful, innocent, and so on, is not typical of the objectivists I have known. And I think that's definitely fair, but for whatever reason, and in part maybe because Leonard has done such a good job of holding up the spotlight on rationalism, um, I think that amoralism is unfortunately alive and well in the objectivist world. And I've seen this in some recent dis movement disputes where many people, including good people, will say things like, well, why can't we get along? We're all on the same side. Like, don't bring up stuff that happened a long time ago. That should be water under the bridge. And usually this attitude is expressed as if it held the moral high ground, that it's the sense of I'm above petty squabbles. And what it really means, I want to argue, is that I'm above moral judgment. So why could a person or why might a person think that non-judgmentalism is morally superior? Um, well, I mean, first, let's you know give them credit. I think what they would say is, look, I'm not against moral judgment. Yeah, we should say like, Kant and the Nazis are bad guys, but what they're saying, what they're what they would say is that there's kind of a focus on superficial trivia. So we'll get to that in a second. But um, I think part of what's going on, why it seems to hold the moral high ground, is simply that culturally that attitude is worshipped. Judgmental is considered an insult. Or if you want to think about it in popular terms, what is a person who's cool? A person who's cool is above it all. They don't care what you say, what you do. They, um, they're just going to sit back, relax, and do their thing, and that it's treated as, in effect, dependent and conformist 
to at all be concerned with moral issues and with moral judgment. And part of it, a second part is that it does count on this false alternative of dogmatic moralizing in a moralism. And it's basically saying, well, I don't want to be a dogmatic moralizer. And so my goodness comes from the fact that I'm an amoralist. And what people end up doing is they often conflate substituting moral judgment for intellectual judgment with passing moral judgment. So they conflate the person who isn't concerned with truth, but is focused on you a good guy or a bad guy, which is if you think about our tribal cultural debate, what team are you on? And it's people who kind of recoil against that and say, I want no part of that. I'm interested in the truth. And therefore, the implication is, well, I'm not interested in moral judgment, that that is somehow detached from interest in the truth. But this is precisely the false alternative that objectivism is challenging. And it's challenging, it's rejecting it at a very deep level. To be interested in the truth requires being interested in morality. And what makes something moral is ultimately that it's true, that it conforms to reality. And so, I mean, a crucial resource here is Leonard Peikoff's article, Fact and Value, which if you just Google, you'll find it. And he points out and argues that every is implies an ought because thinking is for the purpose of living. And because recognizing that something is true, an evaluation follows immediately. If it's a metaphysically given fact that you're recognizing is true, then the good is to conform to it. You know, all right, if this is a metaphysically given fact, then it automatically follows. Am I conforming to it or not? If I am, that's good. If I'm not, that's bad. If it's a man-made fact, and you'll remember we've talked about the metaphysical versus the man-made in one of the early videos, um, then it's good or bad according to what that according to whether it conforms to the metaphysically given. So it's fact and value are not two separate realms; they're two different perspectives on the same thing. What is true, and are you conforming to it? Are you acting in accordance with it? So given that we can't separate fact and value and shouldn't try what would it mean for objectivists to be morally neutral and just get along because we're on the same side i mean what it essentially amounts to is demanding evasion it's as uh leonard puts it no par it's to blind himself to the role of morality in man's life subvert his own character and lose the ability to deal with other men on the basis of objective principle and so it's non-judgmentalism is a form of evasion. It's evading facts about people, the relationship between people and their actions and their character to moral principles. So then you might ask, well, given all that, how could non-judgmentalism be prevalent in objectivism, including by people, you know, who would say that the kind of um, self-conscious uh rejection of the integration of fact and value like david kelly who'd say yeah that's all garbage but why could you why would that still be widespread so at the risk of alienating some of you i'll name two factors so one i think is a tendency for personal disputes to become public and the second is a superficial understanding of objectivism so let's start with the superficial understanding of objectivism the less you understand the philosophy, the more differences about philosophical issues will seem trivial or can seem trivial. And, you know, one way this shows up is kind of numerical thinking. Well, you guys agree in 95% of things and what was the other 5% count? Like that is not at all the issue in philosophy. The issue is, do you agree on principles or not? And this isn't unique to objectivism. Like, you can think of splits in Marxism or Christianity and to an outsider who doesn't understand the, the intellectual context there, most of the disputes over doctrine will seem trivial precisely because they don't see what hinges on them. But a person who's inside of it sees that a small issue, really what seems like a small issue, the whole intellectual ideological uh, system stands or falls on that issue. Now, with the bad guys, you can say, well, look, and all of the end, it amounts to the same things. Like, they're all different variations of things that are bad and wrong and awful. Um, 
But for all the reasons that we've discussed when we discussed integrity, that's not true for true ideas. And so insofar as you think objectivism is true, um, it its value, its truth, its success depends on the integrity of the whole system. And so something that seems trivial, if you really understand it, you can see this as this is the destruction of a real great intellectual achievement, i.e. the philosophy that I live by. The, the, so let's turn then to intellectual disputes becoming public. So here the issue is that when you don't have the full context for a dispute, you can often think, well, why can't you guys make it work? So if you think about like a marriage that falls apart, assuming that the couple don't go around town, you know, telling everybody their side of it. Um, as an outsider, you can often think, oh man, why can't they get along? They're both two wonderful people. And it's, you don't have the context to see why they thought, no, this is irreconcilable. So my general attitude um, is just as in those cases, you really don't know what's going on behind closed doors. And even if they, one of them tried to tell you, even if both of them tried to tell you, getting that context sufficient to have an independent judgment about who's in the right or who's in the wrong uh, or to what extent both are, it's enormously difficult. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. And so my general attitude is one reason private disputes should remain private um, and if it's unavoidable that they, well, let me put it a different way. It's private disputes should remain private. And if it's unavoidable that they be made public, um, then the parties involved have a moral obligation to respect the objectivity of outsiders and not drag them into the mess they have no way of untangling. And that doesn't mean you can't like talk to your friends, but it's trying to litigate it in public, I think is deeply, deeply wrong. It is, shows complete disrespect for the minds of the people you're allegedly trying to persuade. By the same token, I think outsiders shouldn't be busybodies who pretend that, oh, I have a right to know about what's going on between these individuals or inside this organization. And let me just, you know, start acting like a little detective and starting to figure it out. It's that, no, you have the attitude of, um, all right, like, unless I'm an insider, that's your business. And so there's a lot more to say in this issue, but I think that's it for now. All right, so now I want to talk about mercy, altruism, and kindness. And in his uh, lectures on, on objectivism back when he was a colleague of Ayn Rand, Nathaniel Brannon made the point that objectivism is actually hated in his view, and I think this is right, primarily not because it upholds selfishness, but because it upholds justice. So a kind of common sense way to think about justice is identify and support the good, identify and don't support the bad. The deeper perspective, in, I think one interesting place it shows up is in Ayn Rand's letters. And so here's what she says. This is from page 558 of uh, the, the published edition. But I think they're all, or at least many of them, and uh, eventually all of them will be available online. But she says, the basic principle that should guide one's judgment in issues of justice is the law of causality. One should never attempt to evade or to break the connection between cause and effect. One should never attempt to deprive a man of the consequences of his actions, good or evil. One should not deprive a man of the values or benefits his actions have caused, such as expropriating a man's wealth for somebody else's benefit, and one should not deflect the disaster which his actions have caused, such as giving relief checks to a lazy, irresponsible loafer. And so as I mentioned in his MBI lectures, Brandon makes the point that objectivism is denounced and smeared precisely because it champions justice. And I think you get an indication of it just by getting how Ayn Rand's formulating the point. And you can think about it that what bad people hate is justice because it's the opposite of what they're trying to achieve. What they're trying to do is get effects without causes and causes without effects. And if you come along and say, no, you deserve what you earn and you no more and no less, 
I mean, for them, that's a death sentence. That's precisely what they're fighting against. Notice also that altruism you can think of as a morality of injustice, that that is really at the center of what it is. So part of Ayn Rand's justification that we get for selfishness is precisely the is precisely that it is an issue of justice. So this is how she puts it in the introduction to the virtue of selfishness. She says, since all vir- since all values have to be gained and or kept by men's actions, any breach between actor and beneficiary necessitates an injustice, the sacrifice of some men to others, of the actors to the non-actors, of the moral to the immoral. Nothing could ever justify such a breach and no one ever has. And altruism, you can think of, it doesn't try to justify the breach. It just says, no, that breach is good. It's good so long as it comes at the expense of you, of the person acting. So there should be a breach between actor and beneficiary as long as you're the one who loses in that equation. And so to the extent you could even talk about a justification for altruism, it's Well, the alternative is injustice that comes at the expense of others. It's a breach between actor and beneficiary that works uh, to the, you know, benefit of the immoral actor. So we typically formulate the objectivist ethics as, well, it's living for your own sake, neither sacrificing yourself to others nor others to yourself. But I think what we can see here is that we can put it in terms of justice as well, that the objectivist ethic says that each person should bear responsibility for his own choices and he should enjoy the rewards and punishments um, and he shouldn't be able to pawn off his errors on others nor let them siphon off his achievements. So you can think about it that way, that what it really is is taking seriously justice across the board and down to the root. And you can contrast that then Uh, with altruism and the Christian idea of mercy. So we talked a little bit about that before, but what I want to emphasize here is that altruism is anti-justice and it covers that um, and it covers it up by this false alternative that either you commit injustices or you allow them to be committed to you. But it's even worse than that when you think about it, right? Because it's, um, you might think, well, okay, but at least shouldn't we still punish the evil, right? Like if somebody murders my wife, hasn't he done something that altruists would call selfish and shouldn't he be locked up as retaliation for that to protect future victims for the good of others? It's not about me getting my vengeance. It's about him being selfish and therefore we need to protect others from him. But remember our discussion of altruism. It's not really about benefiting others. It's about sacrificing, and ultimately it's about sacrificing the good to the evil. And so what we get with altruism is the virtue of mercy. So Leonard called that unearned forgiveness, and here's what he writes in Opar. If justice is the policy of identifying a man's deserts and acting accordingly, mercy is the policy of identifying them, then not acting accordingly, lessening the appropriate punishment in negative case, or failing to impose any punishment. Mercy substitutes for justice a dose of the undeserved and does so in the name of pity. The pity is not for the innocent among men or the good, but for the perpetrators of evil. And this, by the way, I think is why I regard Christianity not just as kind of wrong, but fundamentally evil, because it's the real source of mercy as an ideal. And, you know, you can think of mercy as a form of dishonesty. It's evading the threat that uh, an evil person poses to the innocent. It's evading the evil that he did to the innocent. It's pretending that he didn't commit the evil that he committed or that he was not responsible for the evil he committed. And so who gains from that? The evil and who suffers the good and nothing could be more perverse than that. So a final topic on this point, which is the issue of kindness. And our culture has basically elevated kindness to a major virtue, if not the major virtue. In fact, one of the interesting things is if you look, want to look for examples of where is sacrifice being promoted and called for in the culture, 
it's all it's i shouldn't say that it's often not conceptualized as sacrifice it's often not conceptualized as like surrender your happiness for the sake of others it's often conceptualized as kindness and again this is not a big surprise altruism is always trying to mask its demands because on the face of it there there's nothing to them and there's a lot against them right and so we're taught to when we're taught to surrender our money to a beggar it's not a sacrifice that's just kindness and if we're taught to sacrifice our convictions say by pretending to believe in god so as we don't offend believers that's not intellectual and moral cowardice that's kindness if we're taught to sacrifice justice by allowing a convict to go free and then giving him voting and gun rights to boot that's not treason to their victims it's just kindness now to be sure like kindness is often a deeply selfish policy being kind to friends and to even strangers all else being equal is good and sometimes morally mandatory nurtures positive relationships it helps create a warmer society it is a um it's a natural outgrowth of our positive feeling about ourselves and our life of wanting the best for other people and wanting to live in a society of people who value other people but to treat kindness as a virtue as a primary virtue as a universal principle of action that trumps all these other things is self-destructive um it's often a demand of self-sacrifice and a rationalization for vice. And I'll just end by recalling our discussion of Sam Harris, his analysis of white lies and the way that he talked about like lying to protect your friend's feelings, lying to be nice is actually an insult to them and hurts them. It makes their lives worse. And I think if you just take that and widen it this is the problem of treating kindness as a virtue as a principle of action is that it often is used to override true moral principles and um you know the it can definitely be true that there's people who are acting on good moral principles and they could stand to be a little nicer and that's important but i think generally the error goes the other way is that we elevate kindness niceness above morality so let's end them with a little bit of advice i don't have too much to say in this but a couple thoughts first of all i would say judge selfishly and carefully that is your it should not be an academic exercise it would be like i want good things and good people in my life and good things and good people in the world i care about that and so i really want to identify the good and really want to do what i can to encourage it and vice versa for the bad but do it carefully because one of the things that we've seen again and again and again this all comes back to the issue of objectivity the truth is not obvious whether a person is good or bad or what the good elements and what the bad elements in them are is not obvious and so if you're not thinking about it carefully if you're jumping to conclusions either you're too hasty to condemn or you're too hasty to encourage and support you're achieving the opposite of your intention you're discouraging the good and you're encouraging the bad you're encouraging the evil so it's you want to be selfish and that should drive you to be careful with your evaluations the second thing i'll say is watch your own motivations when you're engaged in judgment particularly if we're talking about public disputes and passing public moral judgments people will often tell themselves i'm crusading for justice when what they're really doing is they're playing status games trying to make themselves feel superior to others and pretending to be role-playing as moral heroes and if you if you just uh, there's probably a lot you could probably do a whole lecture just on this phenomenon but i think just being aware that that's a real thing that um and if you catch yourself doing it just like don't do that like moral judgment is not for the purpose of achieving unearned superiority um or even earned superiority if you will it's separating the good from the bad so you can encourage the good and discourage the bad 
And related to that, I'll, I'll I'm going to make it, but I'm, uh, this might be controversial because it could be taken the wrong way, but uh, this is what I would call the golden rule or the golden rule of justice. And that's judge others as you judge yourself. And as a standalone principle, that doesn't work because you might be judging yourself wrongly. Um, but that's the whole point. This is a, it's a kind of question rather of like, am I judging others the same way I judge myself or as I'd want myself to be judged? And it's a double check. So there's definitely people who are way too hard on themselves. And it's a good question to ask yourself of, would I ever judge a friend or somebody I cared about this way? Would I hold them to these kinds of standards? And you might very well see no way I'm holding myself to a completely irrational standard and beating myself up for absolutely no reason. Um, and the other side, you can find that, well, I'm judging people way too harshly by a standard that they can never live up to and that I would never hold myself to. And maybe it's, um, maybe I'm not living up to the standards that I should, but more likely it's that I'm not holding them up to the right standards. I'm not evaluating them properly. So a big caveat, you know, it's your feelings are not a primary. You can't just walk around with a, you know, judge others as you yourself would want to be judged. But I think it's a good rule of thumb to sort of keep you from making too common errors, right? Of being too hard on yourself or too easy on yourself and too hard on others or too easy on others. So that's it for this video. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. And as always, the best way to stay in contact is to go to donswriting.com and sign up for the newsletter. Talk next time.